Okay, so welcome back. I hope you all had a good lunch. We will now turn our attention to robots. Ever since the term robot was coined in a play written by two Czech brothers in 1921, these machines have captivated our imaginations. You no doubt know that times have changed since 1921. No longer are ro robots a figment of imagination. They're almost everywhere. Today, Shane Yankee, a graduate student in our computer sciences department, will talk to us about robotics. When he's not studying in our labs, he's working as a senior developer for Cognation Robots here in Winnipeg. His presentation is titled, R2-D2 and Friends, the Future of Intelligent Robots. Please welcome Shane Yankee and his probably performing robots. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, when dealing with robots, there's, there's always technical issues, and no doubt there will be more throughout this presentation, so I apologize in advance. Um, that being said, sorry. Uh, I am Shane Yankee, and I am a graduate student here at the University of Manitoba, I'm currently studying robotics and artificial intelligence in the Autonomous Agents Laboratory here. And like mentioned, I also work at Cognation Robotics, which is a local robotics company here in Winnipeg. So between the two, I'm pretty much working with robots almost every day. So let's get started here. So what is robotics? Now there's many def definitions of robotics. Everybody has a different term, the way they want to describe it. One of my favorites is it's the science of perceiving and manipulating the physical world through computer controlled devices. And I think the, the perceiving and manipulating is a very important aspect as if you're not um, uh, dealing with the actual real world, you're not uh, moving objects and that, you're, you know, your robot's just sitting there not interacting, then you basically just have a computer, it's not really a robot. So um, I like that definition and that comes from a, a book, a really good book, Probabilistic Robotics, um, which many people use during their studies. So there's different aspects of robotics. Um, obviously there's, they're not just computer programs, there's uh, hardware involved. Um, so hardware and software. Now the hardware uh, usually entails different um, disciplines and that includes electrical um, and mechanical and as well as computer engineering. So all of those factor get together, they all have to be working together to build uh, the robot platform. And then of course there's the software running on it which is gonna be the programs controlling it, controlling that hardware. And it's very important that the hardware and the software interact um, very, very, uh, tightly together um, in order to produce uh, the, the desired results that you need. So uh, there's the old saying that the, you're, you're only as strong as the, the weakest link in the chain, or chain is only as strong as the weakest link. Well, that goes the same for all of these aspects. If your hardware uh, is the weak link, you know, you're not going to perform. If your software is the weak link, it's the weak link, it's still not going to perform up to those standards. So all of them are very, very important and they all have their own roles. Um, now, as previously mentioned, I am a computer science student here, so I am a computer science and I deal with the software. So throughout this presentation, we're going to deal with the, the software side of it and the intelligence and the programs running on the actual robot. So there's different components in the, the software programs running on the robot. There's different components and like I said, it's, it's just a computer program. And uh, one of the first things you learn about computer programming is uh, a, a, computer system, a computer program is just inputs, processing, and then outputs. Those are the three main components. So you get something into your program, you do some processing on it, and then you spit something out. So an example that everybody's probably used is, I don't know, say something like Internet Explorer, or you surf in the web, you type in the address that you want, the website, Facebook, wherever you go check your emails. Um, type them in, the inputs are gonna be you entering them into the keyboard, the computer's gonna process that data, go fetch the web pages, whatever, and then it's gonna display it out on the screen, that's the output. So the robots programs have the same thing. Uh, we can alter the words a little bit to perception, reasoning, and action. You're gonna perceive the, the different uh, the surroundings in the environment, you're gonna sense different, different things, obstacles. You're gonna reason, decide what you wanna do. You know, if it, there's a ball in front, you maybe you wanna kick it, maybe you wanna move the object, and then you're gonna 
uh, perform the actions, which will either be you know, walking, moving, bending down, whatever, depending on the robot, of course. Um, so the inputs are various forms of sensors, and they include uh, range finders like laser scanners, sonars, uh, accelerometers, and gyroscopes. Those are usually used to maintain balance and, and, uh, and measure different forces acting on the robot, and of course, cameras. Uh, and outputs are gonna be, uh, those are actuators, any type of actuator, which is like a servo, which is basically just a little small electric motor, actual motors, um, speakers, displays, things like that, pretty much anything that can give any type of, of feedback or information. So a little outline for the rest of the talk. We're gonna go over some, we already had the introduction, and now we're gonna go over the, we're gonna look at some Global Vision robots first. From there, we'll look at local vision. That's where the camera is, rather than being overhead, it's now moved down and physically attached to the robot. Uh, we'll look at some humanoid robots. We'll kind of change from the hardware and go into some development tools and how you would develop them. And hopefully, if there's time, we'll have a little bit of a demo if it works. We'll see. Um, OK, so before we start talking about the robots, uh, I wanted to mention RoboCup and Fira Cup. And these are two robotic soccer competitions, international robotics robotic soccer competitions. And why I wanted to mention that is because most, a lot of my examples are going to be about robotic soccer. And that's one of the main things we do in our lab is to get robots to play soccer. So why robot soccer? Well, there's lots of problems to be solved. It, it is a huge domain. There's, you may think, well, it's easy. Just you know, put the ball in the net. Well, it sounds easy, but it's not. There's many things. You have object and obstacle detection. You have to detect the ball. You have to interpret that it is, in fact, a ball. There's other robots on the field. You don't want to be constantly running into them. You have to avoid them. You don't want to run into your own teammates. Um, you need accurate control. You need to really, really fine tune uh, the control to line up those precision shots, which we'll see later. There are some very, very accurate shots. And balance. If you're a humanoid robot, then you need to be able to balance things like that. So it's actually a very, very difficult problem. Uh, it, the competitions also help drive the research forward. Um, you're always going to be more motivated to to do better than the next guy if you know there's a little prize at the end. You can get a trophy. You can get a little bit of fame and glory. So there's nothing wrong with a little healthy, healthy competition to, to try and motivate people and, and push them forward. And last, of course, it's entertaining for me and hopefully the crowd too. So, so moving from there, we'll go into global vision. Now this is where the, the camera, the system for the, the robots is mounted directly overhead. Um, and there's one vision system for the entire team, and that can consist of either a single camera or multiple cameras, but it's mounted overhead, and they all, uh, there's, there's a server that processes the data. You can see the little arrow comes down to a computer system, and it interprets the images, it detects the, the, all the different robots and the ball, and then uh, decides what it wants to do, and then sends out a signal to the robots. So these little robots, which we'll see on the next slide, are basically just, they're just, uh, there's no computer, well, there's computer systems, but there's no intelligence on these, uh, these robots. They're just basically doing what they're told, and there's uh, computers off to the side that are actually controlling them. But they are all, in fact, autonomous, being controlled by the computers and not by humans. So some of the challenges is we have to identify and track the robots of our own team. This coming down to we want to avoid our own team. You know, you might want to do passing plays, which we'll see later. Um, and they're, they're actually, the teams that are doing this are, are very, very good at it. Now you also have to track the ball. Obviously, if you want to put the ball in the net, you're going to have to track the ball. And opponent robots as well. And you'll see that the teams that can actually track not only their robots, but the opponents as well, will do very, very well. And they'll be able to, to stop shots and move and, and st kind of steal the ball away from, from their opponents as well. So that's very important. So these global vision robots, they focus on the problem of intelligent multi-agent cooperative systems. So soccer is a very, very good example for this as you know, it's, it's a team game that's the goal is to work together to try and score as many goals to beat your opponent. Um, 
And if they can work together by setting up shots and, and doing things like that, then they're gonna be way better than the teams that, that can't and the, where the robots don't work together. So they have colored markers for tracking. You can see on this robot there's all these little dots and that's what actually the vision system picks up. It detects these, these colored circles. And from there they can get the, posi the exact position of the robot and its orientation. Um, they're also omni-drive systems, which means they can go in any direction at once. They don't have to turn first and then move in that direction. They can just you know, zip off any direction. And that's, the way they can do that is, you can see those blue, three blue wheels, and they turn like normal wheels, but on them, there's all those little white cylinders going the opposite way. And what it can do is it can change the speed and, it can change the speed and the directions, like which ones are driving, and then it can actually uh, calculate a vector and, and basically move in, in any direction. So they're, they're very, very useful. Um, on this, this robot here, you can see this is from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, they're one of, probably one of the best small size uh, teams in, in RoboCup. And you can see on the front of the robot, there's um, a little black bar, a little cylinder in the front, and what that does is it spins really, really fairly fast, and then when the ball hits it, it actually rolls the ball backwards into the robot. So these robots can actually dribble the ball and move around the field, and the ball will basically stick to the front. It's kind of actually very neat. Um, also, you may not be able to see it, but there's at the bottom, there's little metal plates, and these are, are kickers, and it basically uses uh, compressed air, and it'll uh, shoot the, um, fire out this, this metal plate, and which will hit the ball and, and shoot the ball at quite high velocities too. They also have chip kickers which are down in front and it kind of gets under the ball and scoops it up and they can actually chip it up and over their, ro their opponents. So. so here, I wanted to show a video of this. Now this is Carnegie Mellon. Like I said, they're one of the best teams uh, at RoboCup. So you can see they're very, very fast. They move around the field very fast. Uh, here's a slow-mo. So you can see they're very good at one-timers. They, they're very good at setting up shots. They'll actually, I've seen them before, they won't even pass it to the robot. They'll just place a robot in front of the net and they'll bank it off the robot, like off the back of the robot and in. So very, very good. There's. That, yeah, sorry about that. The guy's head always, he comes in, in and out. But you can see there, it actually chipped it up and over the robot. There's the head again. <laughs> um, I did want to skip. There's a nice goal there. I wanted to skip up here. to here, this game. Now this is the finals for, for the championship. This is, they're playing against Thailand right now. And in this one, Thailand actually won. So here you can see the accuracy and the precision of the shot, how it snuck it through there. So this is another one too. Um, I'll pause it here. You can see that the goalie is detecting the, its opponent robot and it's always gonna try and be in between the ball and the net. So if I, it actually blocked the shot there. You can see it's gonna go in slow-mo here. So as the opponent moves, the goalie comes across. And even in slow-mo, you can see how fast that shot went. It was just like a blur across the screen. So they're actually very, very fast. Very difficult. This is all, now we'll see later that uh, humanoid robots, they don't have um, this speed. And this is because these, these guys, because of the global vision system, they can have large computers uh, off to the side of the field. You can see on the side here, this is the Carnegie Mellon team, and behind there they have lots of computers doing all the processing and calculations for the, uh, for the team. Okay, so from there, the global, sh global vision system um, kind of took another direction to find something new and innovative, and that's mixed reality. So in mixed reality, uh, the environment is produced by an LCD display which is li um, put flat on the ground and then the robots uh, will actually drive on top of them and an image is projected onto the, the LCD display. So the 
with, for mixed reality, uh, there has to be uh, an artificial portion and a real portion, the artificial portion being the display and then uh, the real portion being the actual physical robots that are gonna be on, on uh, the screen. So there's a world server, which is basically a program running uh, on a computer that's controlling this, this environment and it controls the displaying of, you know, say the soccer field. Uh, there's also virtual elements, um, like a, a ball if you're playing soccer. It controls the physics on that, as well as the interaction between the robots. And because it's a virtual ball, you know, it has to calculate that when the robot drives over it at a certain angle, then uh, the ball will move in a certain direction. So lots of physics calculations involved in that. So all those times you were sleeping in physics class, you thought, you know, this was, you'll never use this. Well, it's, it is actually used in the real world. So to do this mixed reality, uh, we need different types of robots. We need obviously smaller robots. We're not gonna put one of these guys on an LCD screen. It's gonna you know, damage the screen. So Citizen made uh, a really, really small robot, a one centimeter robot. And you probably won't be able to see this, but I actually have one of these robots right here. So this is it. And we place these on the, uh, for the people on the back. I do have a picture. So you can see the, the actual size of it. Uh, these are placed on the LCD screen and then move around and, and interact with the environment. So you can see how small they are, slightly larger than a penny. And if you look, that kind of brownish section in the middle, that's the, the battery, so about one third of the entire robot is just battery, and the battery only lasts for about maybe 15, 20 minutes at a time. So here's some of the, the environments that we've done in our lab. There's our global vision system. Uh, you can see in the top picture, that's our global vision system, camera mounted overhead, and in finding the positions of the robots. So things we have done, soccer, obviously, we always do soccer, uh, an, an obstacle run, uh, Pac-Man, and uh, ice hockey. So here's video, here's ice hockey. Very similar to soccer, you know, except they're carrying the, the puck to the side of them rather than actually being in front, so there's a goal. And with the mixed reality, you can do fancy things like displaying goals and you know, you could have a little Zamboni going, virtual Zamboni going clean the ice if you want. So you're pretty much open to, to anything you can think of. And Pac-Man, everybody's favorite game, of course. Uh, so you can see here, uh, these ones are using larger hats, if you notice, and then the last one, these, that's because this is using uh, an older version of the camera system. It's using a lower quality camera. We've since then upgraded to a higher resolution camera. Um, so you can see those, the blue walls there, it, it can't drive through them, so it can detect that the walls are there. Um, and the people who did this did a very good job at, at uh, implementing all the different aspects of the game. So you can see all the little pellets there that uh, you collect points. You'll see a cherry close to the end come up. You get bonus points for that. Uh, right now the ghost has turned blue because it got one of those larger pellets that turned the ghost blue and then the Pac-Man can go eat it. Um, you'll see right away that the ghost is gonna turn red and the Pac-Man is gonna turn around and start running because now the ghost is, they're basically switching roles and you know the, the hunter becomes the hunted now. So you can see there, turned red, so now it detects that, oh, the ghost is there, it's turning around, running the other way. All right, so local vision robots now. What are we doing? Local vision robots, um, this is where the camera system, the vision system is moved down onto the physical robot. So over here we have, that's a Pioneer robot made by Mobile Robots, that's the company. Um, camera on top, it has a laser scanner. Uh, very large speakers for some reason. I don't know what this one is doing. And then over here, this uh, is a car that's been modified to drive autonomously, and this one has been, been modified for the, the DARPA Grand Challenge, which we're gonna talk, talk about next. But as you can see, how many, just to get the car to accurately drive, um, to reliably drive on its own, all the sensor, all these on the top and the side there are all sensors, uh, laser scanners. You can see there's about four cameras across the top in all directions. Um, laser scanners on the front, the back, just large and large and large amounts of data. So the DARPA Grand Challenge 
It was first held in 2004, and the point of it was to drive a 142-mile course in desert terrain. This was held in Nevada. Um, so the train was very, very challenging. It had winding mountain passes, drop-offs with, you know, hundreds of meters drop-offs on either side, you know, sharp left turns, hairpin turns. You can see there's a couple of hairpin turns, narrow tunnels, and uh, a beer bottle pass right at the end where the nar road narrowed. So after hearing all that, you shouldn't be surprised to know that no team finished. <laughs> So here's some pictures of some teams going through through the course. Uh, you can see this, the first one, the larger one, the van there, jumped the barricades uh, of the course. That guy over there looks like he's kind of running for his life. I probably would be too. Uh, and then this team down here desperately trying to, to hold the robots so it doesn't tip over because um, they veered off course as well. This guy wasn't so lucky. <laughs> Again, hit the side, probably hit a, a mound of dirt, something flipped over. So needless to say, these guys were out of the race as well. The team that did come the closest was Carnegie Mellon University, and they went the furthest with uh, 7.36 miles out of the 142, so. <laughs> not, not very far. And the reason they they uh, were eliminated after seven miles is because their Hummer broke an axle. So they were telling everybody, oh, we would have finished, but you know, our car malfunct malfunctioned, we broke an axle. What they failed to tell you is they detected a false obstacle in the middle of the road and veered off course to avoid it, hitting the ditch, which then in turn broke the axle. <laughs> so. The next year, 2005, they had the same uh, challenge and the winner was Stanford University and that's that's their car right there the car who won its name is Stanley um, the winner of this so Stanford University for winning they got a uh, prize money of two million dollars second place got one million dollars and third place five hundred thousand so very very big prizes but to put things into perspective that car there probably cost anywhere between two and five million dollars so from there, they moved to the DARPA Urban Grand Challenge. Uh, this is the winner of that. That was held in 2007. There was only one of them. This involved vehicles maneuvering in a mock city environment. It was held on uh, an, abandoned, an old uh, um, airstrip, and they set up, and, uh, set up a, a realistic uh, city environment, and the cars had to move in and out of traffic, you know, merge, things like that. They had to park, avoid obstacles. Um, drive through uh, intersections, you'll see, I'll, I'll show a video, busy intersections. And again, they have the, prize, the same prize money. Now, here at the university, we have the not so grand challenge, which is uh, our way of doing things, because we obviously can't afford a uh, two or five million dollar uh, car. So, what we use is a little toy Hummer, so a little bit smaller than Carnegie Mellon's Hummer. Um, but you can see we have vision system mounted on, on the top. Uh, on this one, there's no laser scanners. It's, it was all strictly done by vision. So smaller robots, smaller course, rather than you know 142 mile course, we just use the, the quad outside and just try, try and do some laps around there. And the one downside is there's no prize money. <laughs> so. All right, so humanoid robots. Probably one of the world's most famous humanoid robot. This one here is uh, the Honda Asimo. Uh, very intelligent robot. Again, this one costs about one million to manufacture, and uh, if you wanted to rent it, you could rent it for about 150,000 a year. So, so why humanoid robots? Um, they have numerous joints, usually between 15 for a simple one and 30 for a more complex one. Uh, so the the complexity of controlling and dealing with these robots are, is naturally um, increased. Uh, you have other things you have to deal with, things like balance, joint constraints, worrying about, you know, are you going to move the motor in the, the joint in such a way where, you know, the motor snaps, things like that. So why would why do we want to make things harder for ourselves? Well, some researchers are 
you know, studying humanoid robots to get a better understanding for the human body. And in order to build something, you first have to research it and, and understand how it works. So that's one of the, the aspects. Probably a more reasonable one is to develop a robust platform that's efficient at performing multiple tasks in an environment that's designed for humans. And we can design uh, robots to pretty much do virtually any task. Um, you can see there's one here for, for vacuuming your floors, that one in the middle there. And yeah, it will vacuum your floor, but you know it's not gonna mow your lawn. Well, they do have lawn mowing robots, so you could get that as well. But why have a robot, a single robot to perform every task when you can design one that will basically that can do anything and anything a human can do and perform all the tasks. So a humanoid is the most feasible design to interact in environments uh, built for humans. Uh, take these stairs up the aisle here, for example. You know, these wheeled robots are not gonna be able to negotiate those stairs. But a humanoid could. These ones are probably a little small, that's a big step, but uh, other ones, larger ones, they could easily walk up, like Honda Asimo, it could, um, go up and down these stairs. Another benefit is the tools that we designed for us to use can also be used by a humanoid robot. Um, so basically anything, you know, if we're, we're manufacturing something using certain tools, a hammer, well we can swing a hammer, a robot can swing a hammer just as well. So theoretically, a robot, a humanoid robot should be able to do any task that uh, a human could do. So this is the HRP2 robot, and what the researchers in this laboratory are doing are trying to get the, uh, the humanoid robot to perform day-to-day -day tasks. So you can see it here, the top uh, one, it's washing some dishes. Uh, there it's, it's serving some beverages, or the, the other two photos serving there, it's pouring, and there it's uh, <coughs> serving the beverages. So pretty much anything that we can do, again, this, this guy can be programmed to do. So the challenges of the humanoid robots is obviously, as mentioned before, the control of many motors. So we don't have to, we're not just dealing with, you know, driving forward, turning left and right. We're, con we're trying to control and manipulate every joint. Limited power, power and uh, computation. So you saw before those little small, uh, small sized robots zipping around really, really fast, you know, making really accurate shots. And that's because they, they have off to the side, they have those really, really large computers. With the humanoid robots, a li little bit more limited in terms of uh, the computational power. You can see this guy here. You know, notice anything maybe unique about this guy? If I turn it this way. He has a cell phone for a head. And that's, this cell phone is, is doing all the computation and the, the image processing. It has a camera in it, and it's doing basically the work of all of those the computers off to the side of those small of those small little uh, robots from Carnegie Mellon. So, imagine trying to take all that computing powder and all that processing and shove it into this phone. Very, very difficult. All the algorithms, everything has to be uh, modified in that to to run on on this type of platform. But at least, you know, it can make a phone call and call you when it scored a goal, so that's a benefit. Um, again, more the challenge is vision, uh, the obstacle detection, object detection, recognition, recognizing that it's a ball. Um, and that's, you know, something we take for granted. One of the things we find easy, you know, I can sc scan this crowd of people, there's quite a few people in here, and I can very easily pick out the faces very, very fast of all the people that I know. And uh, for a robot to do this, it's, it's very, very difficult. They can detect certain features. You may see, have seen face tracking programs before. They can detect certain features, but in order to recognize them and remember them, it's, it's very difficult. Um, so here's a processed image of, um, from a robot running on this phone, so you can see this is what the robot might see while it's, it's playing soccer. So you can see the bottom image there, it's uh, a blue goal, and the goals in the Humanoid League are colored blue so the robots can actually detect them easier. Um, and then there's the little ball there. This one's pink, but normally we use an orange ball like that. 
So you can see when, it's pro when the image is processed, uh, it basically just tries to ex extract out key features being the ball in the net, and it's just gonna try and put that ball in that net however it can. But you can see that after it determines, okay, that green spot there now, that's the ball, that's what it's trying to kick, it doesn't know that if it's a rubber ball or if it's actually a piece of fruit. I could swap that ball with an actual real orange and the robot would gladly just walk up and kick it as well. Whereas, you know, somebody, one of us, probably would avoid that. So, the benefits to humanoid robots is um, they do have multiple modes of transportation, not only the various types of locomotion, like walking, running, sidestepping, crawling, things like that. They also have, uh, they, can, they can perform um, a more balanced walk. So if they're walking in an uneven surface, they can try and keep their weight exactly over their feet, whereas uh, if they want to try and go faster, they can, they can use a dynamic gait, which will basically, um, it's almost like a run. They're, if you were to stop the motion halfway through, the robot would fall over. Um, and these are very robust on flat surfaces, but as they become, as the terrain becomes uneven, it, uh, they become a little bit unstable. So this is one of the challenges in one of the robotic soccer, soccer competitions. And it's a stepping field, so you can see each level here, each of the colored surfaces is at a different level. So the robot can e either use vision to detect the different levels by the different colors, that's just, uh, just like the ball in the goal, uh, allowing it to, to process the information easier. Or it can use sensors in its feet. Now these guys are a little bit smaller, and usually they don't have the pressure sensors in the feet. Um, so this guy's trying to step over. And you can see, gets onto the second highest surface, takes one more step. Eh, didn't, didn't quite make it. So, uh, moving to something a little bit bigger from those, those small size robots, this is Archie. This is the newest robot in our laboratory here at the university. And right now, it's just basically legs. It doesn't really have much of a torso. There's no arms yet. It's in the process of being built. Um, but this is a very, very sophisticated robot. Um, this robot alone costs about $200,000 in its current state, and it's basically only half done. Um, but you can see there, there's, uh, it has something unique that, that some of the other robots doesn't have. If you look at its feet, they're very, very long and narrow. And a lot of the other robots you might see, the humanoids, they have a big square foot, like the Honda Asimo has a big square foot. Um, so this one is a little bit narrow, gonna be a little bit more difficult to balance, but it also has a toe joint, which in theory should be able to make it run a little bit easier and, and walk a little bit easier. So changing perspectives a little bit from the hardware aspects and moving into some development tools. Um, some of the development tools that uh, are available are robotic suites. They're called robotic suites. And basically, these just help you uh, develop robots. So you don't have to go to graduate school to become an expert on developing robots. If you have one and you wanted to use it in your home, then you could do that. So these robotic suites usually have some form of visual programming language, which allows you to just basically doing drag and dropping of, of blocks and that to configure your robot. They have a robotic simulator. Uh, and usually have a common interface that you can control multiple robots with this, the same code. And as well, the same code will run on either a simulated robot or a real robot. So some examples of these are the Microsoft Robotics Studio, the Cognition Robot Suite, and Player Stage, which is an open source project. So for the visual programming languages, um, you create, like I mentioned, you create programs by manipulating graphical elements. So this is an example from uh, Microsoft Robotics Studio. Um, you know, fairly complex. This is fairly low level visual programming. But uh, one thing to look at is the end. It has text to speech. So essentially this is just you know, some sort of uh, speaking program. It's gonna run through and then, and then say something at the end. Now the, the logic is the same. So it's, it's also called flow-based programming. 
so you still have to know, you know, the underlying concepts on programming, but it just makes it a little bit easier to pick up. People are usually easier, uh, can usually pick up graphical um, things easier than, than just straight text. So, I want to show you some software. So this is developed by Cognation. And this is basically a graphical um, programming language. So we'll just do something quick to show you how easy it is. This is probably something all of you can do. Of course, there we go. So basically here, as I have a camera, a project which has a camera in it, and uh, I have different inputs and outputs. Remember the whole inputs processing outputs. I can drag on an input, which is a camera, and I can have some outputs. This image buffer here is just to buffer the image, so, um, the, the camera and the display isn't changing it at the same time. And what I can do, that's me. So I got the microphone cord in my pocket and my phone is, uh, <laughs> I guess that wasn't smart. <laughs> All right, so where were we? Um, so I got a camera here, I got an image buffer and now I want to display it. So I just go image out. And I can connect these up just by clicking on one module, dragging it to the next, selecting the output of one, the input of the other. Um, from this, I can generate the project, which is going to generate the code behind the scenes so you don't manipulate all this. Normally, these robotic suites have some sort of runtime, which you have to run the code in. So I'll start that. Can transfer the code to the runtime. Just a couple clicks. So it's all just visual clicking buttons, all done with the mouse. And from here, if I run it, if it works properly, you should see that I now have a display of the camera in my, in my computer here. You can see that the image is upside down. That's a Windows thing uh, in Mac OS. It, it actually is, is the right way. Um, but to show you how easily it can be changed, this is probably something any of you can do, is I can go here and get a flip module, which is just gonna flip the image, connect those together, connect the other ones, save and generate that code, transfer it, and now it's right side up. So very, very easy, probably something any of you can do. And uh, so you can all program your own robots. So this tries to, to alleviate the, the daunting tasks of, of going through and dealing with all the low level underlying code because it is very difficult and, and does take years to master. So another tool in the, uh, in the, the robot suite is a simulator and the generate real world physics uh, and dynamics of, of, um, of a scene. So you can set up and model uh, any type of, of scene you want and then it'll have things like gravity, friction, it'll model sensors, actuators, all the, the different aspects of it. So this is really nice for testing code before uh, deploying, before you actually run it on your real robot. You can actually test, see, make sure it's gonna work. Uh, this would have been useful uh, a couple years back in our lab we were doing some, some projects with uh, a little toy car, something similar to the little yellow Hummer that you saw. And one of the students, their program crashed. And when it did, for some reason, it decided to set the motors to full velocity. So the robot just all of a sudden took off and it was heading straight for the door. And luckily, one of the other students was able to jump over and, and uh, pick it up before it actually you know, ran into somebody. So in this situation, a simulator would have been nice as, you know, we could have saw that, oh, the code is going to set the, set the motors to max and then uh, you could have avoided a possible catastrophe. 
Uh, another thing is multiple developers can can uh, test code concurrently. So at the same time, you know, we both can be developing for a robot. If you know, I have one of these humanoid robots, then you know, me and my other lab partners can all can all be working on it, testing our stuff in a simulator, and then run trying it on the robot after. You can also allows you to test new robots and hardware. So you know, if I have a robot, I want to see you know, adding a, la a second laser scanner. So laser scanners usually run between three and ten thousand dollars for a single laser scanner. So very expensive. Um, if I want to find out if adding a second one will benefit my, my robot any, I can test it out in a simulator and you know, maybe save myself some costs there. And also dangerous or unrealistic scenarios. So you can, in, one of this, in some simulators they have, um, you can either model your own, your own environments or they have uh, unrealistic environments. One of the ones we have in ours is, is we have a Mars terrain where we've actually taken NASA data and mapped out uh, a Mars-like terrain. So you can see what your, uh, pro, uh, your robot would, how it would act driving around on Mars. Um, now one thing to note, no simulation is perfect. They're all, um, we can't calculate everything. Mostly they're just general approximations on everything. And that's usually dependent on the, en the underlying engine and the way the robots and the world is modeled in the simulator. So to show you, simulator, we'll start one up here. And this is Microsoft Robotics Studio. This is the, the simulation portion of their studio. It takes a little bit to start up. It takes a lot to start up. All right, so here is our simulator. Let me just move this to the side. So you'll probably recognize this robot. It's the one sitting on the table over there. This is the NOW robot. It's made by Aldebaran Robotics from France. Uh, and it's currently the standardized platform in the robotics competitions. So I can connect to this simulator. I can go here and you know, maybe make our robot do some, some exercises here. So we can simulate that without actually using the robot. Now this can come in handy, as you probably won't be able to see it, um, but on this guy here, you can see that some of these plastic pieces are cracked and a little bit broken, coming apart. That's because this one has been used and uh, it has had a couple spills. So, all right, we'll just put it down like this. I don't want it to have another spill. So, this guy's still going. Um, so you can see that the simulators are useful as we can you know, save our robots some damage because they are very expensive. This one in its current state, it's uh, probably between five and 10,000 euros, so probably closer to 10 to 15,000 Canadian. Um, so very, very expensive. And you, know, you can test out some fun things here too. You can do a little dance. So that's the simulator, so you can see how they can be useful. Come on. So from there, uh, you can see the simulators, they may remind or look similar to some video games and um, this is kind of something new, it's just starting to take off. and. Actually, the simulators, a lot of simulators out there, including the Robotic Studio and uh, the Cognition Robot Suite, they use the same technologies that's used in game engines. Uh, they actually use the NVIDIA physics, which is a really uh, accurate physics engine. Um, and some other simulators use, uh, it's called Ogre 3D. It's just a 3D rendering uh, engine. So you can see how, um, 
a lot of the technologies used to build robots, to control robots and that can be used in, in video games because they're already starting to merge merge in technologies. And uh, this is a game we've developed at work, AI Apocalypse. It's just a prototype game and uh, basically you can build the AI using a visual programming language and then you know run your program and compete with your, your AI and things like that. So for the future, where are things going? If you've seen the movie iRobot, you'll know that this robot is from, that, from the movie. This is the NS5. Um, it was a very, very sophisticated robot in there. Obviously, we're not at that yet. Um, but I think that's something where we, where we are trying to get to and where robots are actually moving and walking among us. Um, they'll be using our tools. Uh, they could, they'll be cooking using our utensils and things like that, driving our cars. Um, so things like that. Um, so that's where I, th I feel that, that robotics are, is going and where we're trying to get. And we're not all that far off. This is uh, a robot developed and you can see that some of the similarities between the iRobot version, the, the um, arms and, and legs here are, are very similar. And this one actually has artificial muscles in that it's these rubber tubes and, and they inflate it with compressed air and then that'll actually control the joint. So, um, and th this hand here is very, very articulated. It models the hand very, very accurately and it can pick up very delicate um, things like light bulbs and pieces of fruit, things like that. So that's where we're going. We're getting there in terms of hardware. The intelligence part, the software part, we still have a long way to go, as you've seen from some of the videos. Um, you know, we're getting there, but what um, the intelligence is detecting those, those objects, obstacle, obstacles, interpreting the environments and that, we still have a long ways to go. So that's it for the presentation. How am we doing on time? Yeah? How much more time do I have? A couple minutes? Okay. Um, Okay, let's see if we can get one of these robots to drive around. I'm gonna try and get this, this little R2 unit, the, the yellow one, going. Whether it actually works or not, I was having some troubles earlier, that's why we were delayed in the presentation. So we'll see if we can get it going now, just to kinda drive it around a bit. little slow to connect. So we're connected, we're getting the video feed. I see some feet moving over there. Um, let's see if it'll actually. So this robot, it has uh, some, some applications. Um, some of the things it's being used for is uh, telepresence. So somebody's in a remote location and they want to be at a meeting or something, they could have this guy driving around. It does have speakers in it, so you would be able to project your voice through the robot. It has a camera, so you could see what's going on. Um, so, uh, security robots detecting um, Intruders, intrusion detection, things like that. These, it's also ongoing research. Um, also, it could be deployed in, in factories. You could put a variety of sensors on it. It has lots of places for I.O. where you can put uh, different, different types of sensors, oxygen sensors, chemical sensing sensors. Uh, and it can actually detect, uh, 
going the wrong way here. It can detect uh, various chemical levels, so it can actually be used to, to save lives as well in, in hostile environments, things like that. So some of those are some of the applications that it's being used for. Um, and research at several universities, you can see that there are some infrared sensors on it. So if I walk up here, there it stops moving. Because I triggered the, the infrared sensor, you can see it has various ones around the side. And those are just, just a form of range sensor. So that's pretty much it for the little R2 unit. Uh, I was going to try and show some of these other ones, but I think we're pretty much out of time. Okay, we're going to take a break. So um, maybe while we're doing the break, then I'll see if I can get some of these these going. If you want to stick around, or. Yeah,